And welcome to those who have just joined us. This is our third session, third session today on the main stage. And this session is dedicated to investing in AI and the data startups. Before this, we had a uh, showcase where we uh, had representatives of uh, Georgian AI and data startups. And now we're gonna talk about investing in AI and uh, data startups. I'm Haik, I'm the co-founder of Axel, which is the Georgian Business Angel Network. I'm an angel investor myself and I run uh, many other startup support programs. And I'm happy to be sharing this stage with our amazing uh, panelists. Let's start with uh, Irakli. So Irakli Bekwa, he's a serial entrepreneur. He had a couple of successful exits. He, uh, he brings the ed tech expertise. Uh, I'm not going to spoil what you're going to announce on Monday. Let them follow you um, on LinkedIn. And Irakli is also a member of our Angel Investor Network. Let's welcome Irakli Vekwa. Uh, we also have Sergei Gvarjaladze, who is the Business Development Officer at uh, recently announced, recently started Getari uh, Foundation. They are doing venture investing and a lot of other exciting things. So Sergei will have a chance to tell us more about that. Welcome, Sergei. And uh, our third panelist is Sopo Chkoidze. So uh, Sopo is an entrepreneur. Many of you, especially if you are from Georgia, you probably know her as the co-founder of Pulsar AI, which was pretty much one of the first successful Georgian tech startup exits. They got acquired last year uh, to a company called Spincar, which is now called uh, Impel. But uh, Sopo didn't just sell her startup. She continues her uh, journey. And now she is the VP of operations at Impel. We are super proud of you. And we are also joined by our fourth panelist, Amir Roberto. Uh, Amir is an angel investor and he is based in Singapore. So he'll be bringing a very interesting perspective on uh, you know, how the things are uh, in terms of investing in, in the Asian region. Thanks for being with us, Amir. So, um, Let's uh, clear the air. Uh, there is, um, it is difficult not to see what's happening in Silicon Valley. Uh, and I'm not talking only about the layoffs uh, that the large companies and some of the startups are having, but also the startup funding. There are some conversations. There were a lot of memes in summer that this is all activated there, you know, out of office uh, 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 responders, and they are not investing in startups. Just from your perspective, how are the things in Georgia? Uh, maybe uh, Sopo, you can share also how are the things in, in the US and Amir can share us with the Asian perspective. Let, let's start with Sopo. Yeah. Well, now I don't, yeah. Hello? Yes. Okay, awesome. So thank you for your question. And I do agree with you. There's a lot of um, uncertainty in terms of what the future is going to look like in the, um, not only in the US, but in the whole world, for sure. Um, there are a lot of talks between like a potential re recession and how do we overcome these fears. And um, as you can see now, people, the companies, big companies are laying off a lot of people because they fear that um, there is a potential um, uncertainty um, in the nearest future. And um, that's one of the ways that uh, companies try to cut costs and um, try to grow their runway as much as they can and finance all of their um, uh, all of their fixed expenses um, as they can. In terms of Georgia, um, I mean, I wouldn't say that it wouldn't be like there are a lot of factors, not only recession, but, you know, there's a war um, going um, around um, in the neighborhood. And it is a there are some of the macroeconomical um, challenges that we are currently facing. And um, I mean, for us, we try to keep as um, high motivation and energy within our employees as much as we can. But of course, there are a lot of factors that um, you need to take into the consideration. And yeah, we are seeing some of the startups having difficulties to raise money as of today. But I think, I, I highly believe that it's a short-term um, 
um, short-term decision. How are the things in Asia, Amir? Not, not to generalize, I know you mostly have experience in China and Singapore and Asia itself is a very complex market, but like the markets that you have, you know, your, your, your finger on what's happening there. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, before I go ahead, I want to give several things that I learned in Asia, starting with China. Before I go ahead and talk about China, how many of you in the audience have been to China? Raise your hands, please. Okay. So it gives me an idea how to start. So to give an example, uh, I want to start with the Henry Kissinger. Um, he had a great explanation when he first went to China to strike a, a, a deal. He said, when Americans or Europeans solve a problem, they believe they solve the problem. When Chinese solve the problem, they believe they solve the small problem of a bigger problem. And when I look at the concept of AI, China is changing its perspective from made in China into innovated in China. And they have a mission by 2025, China should not be perceived as made in China, low cost product. They have to be in fact, innovated in China. And one of the best products they have so far in the world that we all know is a TikTok, that's number one. And number two, China is the second largest unicorn producer after the US and they compete extremely heavily together. China has on a government level, a mission which is included in five year plan 2030, we have to be dominant in AI by 2030, and they pour billions. One thing that I like about China, just for the, for the argument's sake, I'm not promoting China, I'm not China man, I'm not a communist. This is based on my observation about China and in China because I lived in China for five years. So when I went to the, I lived in the US a lot, seven years, one thing that I learned about Americans, so IPO-based companies, startups, quarrel with the governments depending on the state, depending on the legislation. Whereas in China, governments work closely with corporations and they're united. By 2030, what government has said to Alibaba, to Tencent, to Baidu, and a bunch of other companies that are not on the IPO, you should do anything possible. We're gonna give you as much money as you need to compete with the Americans at any cost. It shows how significant the competition is. If any of you have a startup, I bet, you go to China, it makes it easy for you to get funded than in Silicon Valley. I lived in the US seven years, seven and a half years. I failed all the fundings. I, uh, nobody gave me the money. In the first year of living in China, in Shanghai, I got two funding immediately. So that given an idea how easy it is to get the funding. But when it comes to IP, be sure that your IPs will be technically lost by the Chinese. So they're going to get that. Yeah, thanks. We, we, we want to talk about IP uh, in a while because I'm excited to have Sergey who brings that expertise. But but uh, basic two questions for you, Sergey. Well, first of all, it's amazing that your foundation and, and that you started like making VC investments like literally a few months ago, where these conversations in the Silicon Valley already started. Like we know that there is a crisis in Silicon Valley. We know that the American VCs are you know tightening the things up and then we see you guys announcing yeah we're going to start investing um in startups right so why this timing do you actually agree that there is a crisis because what i can also do is i can share some hard data that in some directions the vc investing is actually growing the number of the new vc funds number of the elps the average size of the invest some other numbers are growing right there's some panic but there's some data and then if you can also talk about your focus on the ip so actually, um, to make it very clear, we are uh, crisis children. So we were born uh, through the, uh, those crises uh, that are surrounding us, uh, not only uh, the crisis uh, in the US, but also the crisis that we have just around the border. Uh, all this movement of uh, professionals from the creative industry, because we are very much uh, uh, straight, uh, you know, pushing the idea that the creative industry is the main industry of the future. That's why we say that uh, we are uh, VC for creative industry and the creatives right now are on the move. Most of them obviously are uh, in the uh, North America, uh, obviously in China, which is a very complicated uh, market and uh, it's very hard to approach uh, these markets there. But also this region, you know, the region which is um, known for its creativity. I'm not talking only about uh, 
uh, Georgia, but generally about the Black Sea, Caspian Sea region. And uh, this is this we saw as an opportunity. Basically, the stakeholders, the founders of the of our uh, foundation, they are coming from the uh, area of intellectual property and IT. And uh, uh, so, at that very moment when these thi things happened, we we understood that uh, there will be plenty of people uh, moving, for changing their locations. And we see, actually, if you go to Vera District here in Sololaki, we, you, you see those guys here working expats. Uh, and uh, this, this we consider as a very big opportunity. Uh, I must admit also that it's very hard to approach these people. They are not integrating in our society here. Uh, but And another thing is that we're also partly losing them. You know most probably that uh, Turkey, for instance, Germany also, are changing their perspective towards these people, and they are, you know, suggesting them to move to those countries. Uh, Turkey is uh, extremely uh, fast in this, especially in terms of, uh, you know, all the visa regulations. Uh, Germany, I, I heard recently that there is a line staying outside the German embassy here, and uh, these um, uh, people from uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia are applying for two visa, and uh, it, this time it's going to be different. I remember in nineties Germany, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, get the possibility for Indian uh, IT workers, but that was a failure because these people got the European visa and then they moved to the UK, and that's how the UK London story started. So yes, we this crisis uh, we see it as an opportunity, and I, I'm pretty sure that most of us see it uh, as, as an opportunity. But we need to do, it's very complicated. Uh, there are obviously political issues. Uh, there are lo lots of issues of security. We don't really know exactly who this, I, I believe that most of them are good people. They understand what's happening with their countries right now. But it's also complicated for some companies and obviously for venture capitalists also. Thank you. You started your initiative amidst the, you know, conversations about recession. Formally, it hasn't happened yet. You started it amidst, again, the, the decline in, in the Silicon Valley or the so-called decline in the Silicon Valley. And, of course, in the middle of the war, right? And we started our angel investor network last year in the middle of pandemic. And Irakli was the very first, one of the very first of our uh, members. So I agree with you that we see this crisis as an opportunity just the way we saw, you know, the COVID crisis and the pandemic as an opportunity, right? Because uh, I also mentioned a bit earlier, you know, about all of these layoffs in the Silicon Valley. This was not the thing last year, but when the rumors about recession started and recession equals layoffs in any industry, in car industry, the same happened in 2008, right? So we knew this is coming. I mean, we see this as an opportunity for the new startups. One of the days how this can happen is these layoff people, instead of working for Meta or Google or whoever laid off them, but Google didn't have layoffs, they're going to join startups or they're going to spin off and they're going to launch their own startups. Irakli, what opportunities did you see last year when joining our angel investor network? Hey, uh, okay. Do you hear me? Okay. Okay. It works now. Okay. Anyway, like statistically, in, during the crisis, there are big opportunities as well, and uh, like uh, Airbnbs and uh, companies like that uh, born in uh, um, 2008, 2009 crisis, right? Uh, I don't know uh, how, like in Georgia, this year is like economically booming, right? We have uh, uh, economic rise of 10% or more. So I don't think that uh, what's happening in Silicon Valley currently is directly affecting us uh, because uh, uh, like um, startup scene in Georgia is rising in terms of uh, activities. There are more people uh, there are more people who are starting startups. It's maybe thanks to Pulsar AI as well. There are angel investors who got some money from Pulsar AI who want to increase more. There are more people do, who hear that, okay, someone invested some 10K or 20K in somewhere and got uh, like a good ro uh, return on investment. So uh, there's more people who are starting startups and there's more money available in Georgia than two years ago, for example. So it's not directly affecting. Um, but the uh, thing is that uh, if uh, in Silicon Valley, because of like low interest rates, uh, et cetera, uh, getting funding was relatively easy, 
uh, in Georgia still, um, and you can, you could go, got some money without due diligence or something. We all know from about the case of FTX from the last week or uh, and etc. Uh, things are not the same in Georgia, right? So um, I think that I, I look positively at, at this. I think that um, in the world uh, of uh, VCs in general, uh, money was too cheap and uh, there were many startups who just got a money without any like um, backing. Uh, and uh, I think that just uh, more due diligence will be done and it will be very hard to get money from the not so quality startups who just have an idea or something like that. But uh, I think that this money, which is still available, will go to the startups who has some products, traction, etc. Thank you so much. And again, let's not generalize, like, of course, it's okay to say tech startups in this context, but our panel specifically focuses on AI and data startups, right? I, I believe there is some data and we can go and, you know, do our homework and research, but I've already read a couple of articles. There is no decline in funding the AI and data startups in Silicon Valley. Why? Because that's the future, right? And again, we have, we have Sopo who uh, built uh, a, a, and, and had a successful exit with her own AI startup. You actually have that um, expertise too. L let's talk about the specifics of AI and, and data startups, like in general, why they are still so interesting to the investors, or let me put it this way, why do the investors prefer this versus any other tech uh, startup, please, Sopo? Well, thank you for that question. For um, our case, I believe AI is still in an emerging um, domain and people still try to um, understand what it can potentially do. And it is a very interesting, if you look um, at the, you know, that way, there's a machine vision use cases, there's NLP, there's are, there are certain things that we haven't yet tapped into. And that is the potential that AI has with the tech startup, startups, I like I I agree with you. Actually, they there were a lot of startups who overpromised and underdelivered, and that is why investors are now backing out. But um, on on the other side, I do see why would um an investor invest in let's say Web three or um. AI, because they believe that this is the future and the use cases that we have seen um, validates the market. And uh, for us, uh, with our investors, we were able to show with our product that we had um, how we would apply AI into the conversations that we were having with their with the customers, and those um, that was the main reason um, investors were interested because we already had a product and the product that was um, fully um, automated and um, you know backed by um, AI. So I I believe that's I, I think I answered the, your question, but um, that is why. Even for us, like, um, you know, when we got the uh, funding, when we sold our company, our mission was not to like retire and like go somewhere else, right? Our, our goal was to reinvest this capital into the local startups and help them to um, grow and share our expertise because, um, you know, it is very difficult, like, um, even if we... Um, brag about how good we were it was really difficult for us to um achieve this right and uh, we wanted to make sure that that would not be the case for any other startup who wanted to go um the same um route so um i think for us um reinvesting in our experience and capital was really really important thank you so for just a quick follow-up uh, and i'm not expecting you to disclose you know confidential deals but do you necessarily prioritize investing in AI and data startups given your expertise and, and your experience? And what are you looking in a startup as an angel investor? Yeah, um, that's a really good question because um, for me, the mo most important factor is um, the people who is behind um, the startup. Like with us, uh, we have been working together like for years before we started um, working on um, um, virtual assistant for the US market. And for us, we see the value on how teams are collaborating with each other. And I think that plays the most important factor as well as the product. So those are the two domains. 
I mean, I, I don't honestly like tap into the market that I'm not really familiar with. Like, you know, you won't see me like investing in agro startups, for instance, because that's not something that I am familiar with. But um, I usually look at this way, like if 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 the team behind um, the idea are you know, genuinely like experienced and they know, um, um, they know what their, you know, what their vision is. And if they have that product, uh, and, um, they chose the right segment, that is definitely something that we are, um, very interested in. Uh, thanks a lot. So Pro, a question to Amir, uh, and I want to like sort of drive this conversation in, into the topic of the regulations, because we know that, again, I absolutely agree with Sopo, AI, is an emerging technology, data-driven startups, data science startups. Like 10, 15 years ago, it was not a thing. Even, you know, seven, eight years ago, we were just seeing, you know, the first baby steps. And now it is the thing, especially we, we spoke about this a bit earlier, you know, what opportunities the open AI and Dolly and platforms like that are, are creating in terms of how powerful and how efficient AI has become. But then we also used to have all of these conversations within the past four or five years about, you know, countries like China and other um, um, the countries where AI is not necessarily used just, you know, as a tool, you know, for business and, you know, the good and, and the governance, but is used, you know, to, to surveil uh, people, for example, right? That's so again, do you, you important question. As, as an investor, yeah, how do you draw that line, basically? Well, technically, I want to comment first on what you just said, which is quite important, why we moved from tech to specifically Web3. Um, how many of you know the company called British Analytica? Obviously. So so when, when Donald Trump came out in favor of becoming president, everybody was laughing in the US. So somebody reached out to British Analytica and said, we need to get this guy to become a president. And British Analytica was used to collect the data, trend data, and applied in Facebook and Donald Trump became president. And Christopher Wiley, who is the whistleblower, told how data was manipulated to change the public opinion within the United States. And Russians were blamed, some other um, bad actors were blamed, but the fact is about data. Who had access, who manipulated, and what happened. And Donald Trump at the end became a president. This is the um, an example that I'm going towards the China regulations. I was hanging out with a good friend of mine. She's a female, she had a baby who was three weeks old. Police officer stops us and asks for an ID. He looks at an ID and tells, how is the, your baby's name? He knew the baby's name by looking at the ID. That's the first point about surveillance. Two, police officer knew that we were going to Starbucks, which was 15 minutes walk from the apartment where I was staying because I always go to Starbucks in the morning before I go to the office in Shanghai. And third part that made me think, in Shanghai alone, there were 100,000, officially speaking, surveillance devices. They could collect the data, where you're going, what you're talking about, and nobody, say, could have pinged to the government. So technically, if you are developing AI in China, if it's successful, you're going to get acquired or you're going to squeeze out. That's what happened to me. And they're going to use your IP for their collective benefit. So most Asian countries like be it the Vietnam, ex exceptions like South Korea and Japan, others like the Philippines, um, the Vietnam, the Myanmar, Indonesia, also questionable. What I learned, most Asian countries think as a collective, um, collective body, whereas in the West, it's individual. That's where the countries spent a lot of budget, specifically China, humongous budgets to control the population using the, 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 the power of the AI, using the power of data, using the, the deep learning. And, and to answer your question, it's quite difficult to survive as a liberal democratic AI company in China or other Asian countries, with an exception to South Korea, Japan, and Singapore. Um, that's sort of my observations about the, um, the Asian Pacific. Thank you. I want to challenge Sergey, and Sergey is my good friend. I can challenge him publicly. Your um, foundation, one of the priorities you have, as you mentioned, investing in IP, right? That's music, that's, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, copyright. How do you see your future or this balance between powerful uh, platforms like, again, Do Wally and um, Dolly and uh, OpenAI and dozens of uh, others, which are 
trying to replace the creatives, which are trying to, you know, replace illustrators, designers. And we also have the same thing happening, not only in visual, but also in the uh, text uh, generation, which is very uh, creative and sounds like a human wrote it. Like eventually AI might end up, you know, writing entire books, right? Uh, how, yeah, how do you see this going? Articles already for major outlets here. Right. So, 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 in, yeah, sorry. So, so, like you investing in creative professionals and their IP, and then AI raising and saying, well, you know what? We don't need humans. We're going to do it on our own. So, th this is going to be very complicated in the future, I understand, especially in terms of uh, intellectual property. Um, uh, I'm releasing, I, I'm just bringing a small uh, example. Uh, I'm trying to release a small EP uh, with my songs, but uh, with my images, etc. And I'm using those, uh, there are plenty of them right now, you know, uh, those image uh, creators or whatever we call them. So at the end, frankly speaking, I, when it comes to, uh, to registering my whole project, I didn't really know how to register it because I don't know, uh, am I the author of it while writing the text uh, because it's mostly like my lyrics and what's come out of it like image wise. So I, I, don't, I don't know. And obviously the old school uh, copyright societies and patent agencies obviously believe me, they have no idea about that. So this is gonna be a very big challenge. And I, I think that to solve this problem somehow, we will need to use again AI to, you know, to, to help us to identify the works, identify who was working on it. Like, was it machine? Is it man-machine kind of work? Maybe we will need a new subjects of copyright, you know, like whenever we will decide to register something. I also think that the, uh, the uh, it's gonna be a revolution and Frankly speaking, I don't think that uh, copyright societies uh, would love what we are doing right now. So actually, we say that blockchain gives the opportunity for artists, creators generally, uh, to communicate directly, to collaborate directly. And this all collaboration can be registered and it's very easy to prove. So it means that the third party is not needed anymore. So if I start a song with you, you will sing for me, I'm playing guitar, and we are working in the same layout, uh, uh, the same platform. The platform knows what was your part and what was my part. And it generally like can go directly to the blockchain. So it's going to be another challenge too. Le legislation is an is issue, as you know, like intellectual property is a big issue for uh, generally for lawyers, uh, because they are making lots of money on it. And I think that uh, at one point, we, we, lawyers won't be any more needed. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm pretty sure there will be some lawyers here or uh, people from this area. Uh, so there are lots of challenges. And uh, this is happening not only in our creative area, but also for instance, in health uh, industry, the, like what are we going to do with all this data? You know, uh, obviously the issue with the driverless uh, cars, you know, who's in charge when the accident happens. So I think that uh, generally uh, the uh, legislative side of it is going to change very rapidly. Uh, there will be a big fight, a battle, because people don't want to lose their jobs and their money, obviously. I had a good point. Um, thank you very much for reminding me. Um, so the, the, the ByteDance is a mother company that developed TikTok. There is TikTok International and there is TikTok Chinese, which is all about censorship. It's called Douyin. Um, they, they developed the experiment. So they give a subject, one to human being, the other one is to the AI. So the subject was written informatively by the human being, but AI included so many emotional components that people were crying, which was extremely scary. And this AI is being used in media. And this AI is being used in apps and keep people addicted to their devices. For example, here, we can communicate with you like human beings. If any of you have been to South Korea, Japan, or China, people are literally addicted to their phones. They don't communicate. And that's scary for me. That sort of motivated me to leave China for some time. Another point is, um, you said that somebody in the audience represents or from Eric Schmidt Futures Foundations. Would you please raise your hand? Let, let, let's not do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'll do confrontation. Where, where am I going yeah. with that? So the point is, 
Google acquired um, the company called DeepMind for $400 million. And they trained old Chinese chess game called Go. So AlphaGo played against the champion in Korea. His name is Saladol. He was a 17 times world champion in an Asian Chinese chess game. And guess what? Historically, um, the, the DeepMind, which was trained based on data, won the, the human being. That was a historic moment when AI, uh, using the data set that it had, using deep learning infrastructure, won the guy who was a 17 times world champion in AlphaGo. It just talks about the complementary what, what, to what Sergey said. That's why we believe in Web3. We believe in decentralization and giving power back to people. And existing AI tools could be in the hand of bad actors. And I give an example of Donald Trump or in the hands of the community as long as there is ethical questions solved, legal questions are solved, I think we have some kind of room for further collaboration in the future. So that's the point I just wanted to make. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, an AI winning over human does not surprise me for almost 20 years now. I think this is when the computer won over Gary Kasparov, the chess. And for me, that was, you know, a new page in the history of you know computing basically because we always and again I, I spoke about this a bit earlier as a teenager I was asked the question like who is smarter a human or a computer and my response was well a human because it's the human who created that engineered the computer right now the answer to that question is a bit more complex but to me it's so obvious that an AI could obviously humans trained the AI humans trained that computer to play chess and humans trained you know, to, to, to play that game. I just wanted to say, Sergey, I wish your technology existed back in the 60s because we would never have had Beatles split up because Lennon and McCartney wouldn't have that, you know, fight over who actually wrote which song, right? But um, speaking about um, IP, I want to briefly touch the topic of blockchain because uh, there is huge crash happening in terms of the NFTs and this is, obvious crash. I don't think there is a second um, opinion there. But then the question is, why they crashed? They crashed because there was no utility? How, do, do, like, very subjective question. Do you see future in NFTs, like very short and concrete? Obviously, I, I would say yes, as we consider ourselves to, uh, very much uh, into blockchain and Web3. But uh, NFT, this is just an technology you know you can use it in different ways uh, for instance one of the solutions that we are developing and searching for companies to in startups to develop it is uh, simply even the uh, you know that we are developing this um, physical uh, creative hub so we also want to uh, create a virtual hub for creatives and obviously these collaborations, they could run through NFT agreements. And we even use sometimes the, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, name for it, like NFT companies, for instance. Obviously there was a hype about NFTs. I don't, I don't know why uh, this crashed. If I knew that I would be a rich well, man, so obviously. I can answer because they were just selling JPEGs. They were just selling images yes. for $300. Yes, and it, it was, uh, you know, for majority of people, it, it was ununderstand. It is still ununderstandable for me how these uh, 13 years old teenagers made so much money on. I'm I'm sorry for this for for these crap images, but the, I I understand there is some kind of uh, logic there. But NFT is the future, obviously, because it's a, it's a possibility to you know register clear like with without any doubts of your works for instance in in terms of creative industry you know so i i wouldn't mind uh, to see what's going to happen in two years because it's uh it's happening so fast right now uh these companies i i like also these guys you know from N nft industry let's call it they adopt very fast they changing very fast i communicate with some of them from time to time and then it, it, this is a type of people which I like. They know how to survive and how to develop themselves and change them, themselves very much. So big up for NFT anyways. Thank you, Sergey. I have a question uh, to Irakli. If you, of course, want to talk about Loopy AI, uh, your educational startup. Can I comment for it? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. First of all, regarding the chess, because yeah, uh, uh, when Kasparov lost to the computer last time, uh, it was just computer, you know, a human trained computer, really. 
and uh, yeah, still he complains about some things during the second match. But uh, thing is that okay, we know that from start of two thousands, computer was much uh, much stronger than human. Uh, like human ca- couldn't already beat uh, uh, computer was already already beating or doing the like. Um, Oh, what's uh, I make? Yeah. Anyway, like it was all draw or or the you know, comp- computer was winning, but the thing is that uh, after uh, DeepMind, which uh, uh, Amir mentioned, uh, like Stockfish, which is the one of the strongest engine in chess, plays ugly chess. So that's why like uh, chess is still popular, like human chess, still very popular. Actually, it's rising during the COVID. It, well, chess had a huge bu- boost. But uh, uh, problematic thing with computers was that, okay, nobody was watching that. It wasn't so, so exciting, etc. While with AI and DeepMind, we saw a creative chess. There was a uh, like one of the important, before this uh, Go match between uh, AI and human. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a like a match between Stockfish, strongest uh, chess engine, and AI, who learned chess one hour ago. To be like frank, uh, like Stockfish was wasn't on the strongest level. Uh, I mean, like uh, he was limited in time to calculate. But si- still, they played hundred games. Ninety of them were, were draw, and ten of them uh, like won by AI. And thing was that all of these games from AI was beautiful. Uh, when asked uh, Magnus Carlsen's like first uh, deputy like trainer. Uh, he, he his comment was like um, I re- still remember that okay I saw chess probably from another planet so that's how dramatic changes uh, comes from AI it's not just uh, like uh, okay m- uh, stockfish can calculate and no never l- uh, lose to human but uh, uh, it's all also beautiful uh, regarding NFTs yeah uh, why it crashed maybe because it wasn't decentralized yet. Like NFTs, um, there will be still many blood. I mean, uh, on on the streets, uh, on the second wave of NFTs or something like that, because many people just are buying hype, right? So you don't understand technology. They don't understand why it can be worthful. That's why, like, uh, if uh, you are buying something to resell it to someone, at the end of the day, bubbles are busting, right? So it was very, very it was a bubble. Unfortunately, yeah. I cannot chart it. Uh, uh, there wasn't <laughs> tools for shorting that. But uh, yeah, um, all ninety um, percent of NFTs currently are just open CNFTs, which is not like real NFTs even. It's just controlled by one company, uh, built on one API. So yeah. Yeah, I thanks a lot uh, for sharing your insights. I just want to talk about Loopy, if you want to, if you are ready. If I'm not mistaken, that's a tool, you know, uh, with AI component helping check homework for the students. Uh, and the broader context of that, like, where do you see AI replacing, you know, education, academia, to a what degree? Like, what's your futuristic take on that? Uh, it's a hard question. For sure, like, when we started Loopy AI, our uh, logic was that, okay, it will be very helpful. We build it like model was working, but at the end of the day, when we sold the company, uh, it was not connected to AI. Like AI wasn't like bringing the much value there. So like company which we sold wasn't about AI anymore. Uh, even we were proud of our technology, we loved it. We tried to like include it in the product, etc. But yeah, it wasn't uh, like about the solving the problem. It was just fancy thing for us, uh, not for the customer. At the end of the day, yeah, like um, all, all of like in in terms of teachers, maybe 70, 80 percent of their job are very monotonic, very monotonic. So you don't like what they are doing because, yeah, it's not just interesting. And uh, at the end of the day, in m- multiple years, maybe it will be changed by AI because things can be done by computers. Uh, there is some human involvement still needed. Well, maybe it's not like uh, near five or seven years when it will be changed, but uh, for sure every uh, job which is not creative will be replaced by AI most probably. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Irakli. And I think something similar Sopo is doing and Impel is doing when it comes to automating the sales, right, uh, with the car 
uh, in, in, in the car industry. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, yeah sure. So our mission, and that was actually like one of the ob objectives that we had to overcome. Um, our uh, mission was not to replace humans, but to enhance their performance. And because at the end of the day, we truly believe that in order to close the deal, and by closing the deal, I mean, selling a vehicle to a customer, right? It does need some human interaction. And we truly believed in that. But we tried to, like as Iraq mentioned, we tried to um, take away all of the mundane and, you know, same tasks and works and um, ideas that they have been working on and try to automate it. And we let our salesperson or whoever at the end of the day is selling the vehicle, we tried to um, cut out all the information, all the mundane work that they have been assigned to do and automate it. That way we gave them an opportunity to work on closing the deal. And that helped us to position our product. And um, that on the other hand, helped the salesperson to close more deals. So that was, I think like I truly believe that it's all about the how how do you communicate this to a customer how do you introduce a product to the market and uh, I, I do agree like in the beginning it was a lot of fear in terms of oh do I have to like let my people go but um that was one of the objections that we strongly strongly had to like train and teach and mentor and let them know that this is not the case for us and um you know, we, um, for, um, for a handful of our, um, customers, we even like issued like a, um, trial, um, version of our product to ensure that that would not be the case. And, you know, successfully enough, like, um, all hundred percent of our, of our customers converted into paid customers. So it's all about how do you, how do you envision and how, how how do you try to introduce AI? And for the automotive industry, like the technology is very um, lacking. It's not as um, um, it's not as um, um, how do I put this developed in, in like any other um, industry. So those were the objections that we had to work um, our ways through. Okay, thanks a lot, and amazing conversion rate, by the way. I mean that, that that sounds incredible. That's very motivating. A question to you, Amir. Just back to the you know Asian context. Again, you lived in China. You lived in Singapore. I believe you've traveled a lot. You probably know that culture a bit better than than we do. But in that context, to my knowledge, they are known as very hardworking people. There is a huge working class in those countries, and the level of automation is still not that high. It's still going there. I mean, compared you know to the U.S., they have very high productivity rate which means like in Amazon, right? There are like so many robots, but like in an average average Chinese factory, you have, you know, like tens of thousands of people doing very basic uh, manual um, work. What is the political context of their, like of AI and, you know, the robots replacing those jobs? And because in the US, this transition has been quite slow. Of course, like there are many depressive regions and, you know, many uh, hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs. But if that happens in Asia quickly, that, that will be a catastrophe. What do you think about that? That's an extremely deep question. And I think my limited thinking cannot answer, but I could explain from what I have seen, what I have learned. And when I spoke with people working in an in in AI industry, we spoke about, about these issues with people from Tencent in particular. So how many of you know China's grand strategy called One Belt, One Road? So One Belt, One Road is what I call the China branding operation that involves more than 85 countries where China is trying to become number one trade powerhouse to compete against the West and the American superpowers, number one. And number two, because as I said earlier, China has a mission by 2025, China has to become innovated in China, not made in China. And the turning African countries, we spoke, we spoke about if 58 African countries, like more than 45 of them, in my opinion, belong to China. That's where they're moving their manufacturing powerhouse and keeping the brains in China to innovate and create. That's number one, what I remember when talking to the people from Tencent and conducting my research because I wrote several articles. That's number one. Number two, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, in my view, are extremely AI friendly. But if I talk about Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, Indonesia, that is the 
massive ethical question and moral question. If we put people into work and then, then develop, we are doomed to failure in terms of civilization. In Indonesia, Malaysia, for example, they have two types of law. One is called Sharia Islamic law, and two is the British common laws that they use. So these are the questions when I was talking to people, they were questioning, but there was not any particular consensus in terms of the how they're going to use or integrate or apply AI in a workforce. But AI is a big in finance. I do have a lot of friends that use AI in trading crypto in particular. AI is a big deal in automotive. I know that Tesla has a, a, a factory in Shanghai. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you, probably later you can answer, how your platform is going to help when selling the self-driving vehicles probably later on. And the third point, what I remember- Tesla doesn't use dealerships, so forget about that. <laughs> No, I remember seeing the, um, it's not necessarily a dealership. So Tesla developed Apple kind of, uh, Apple kind of store in Shanghai, the one vehicle, two people, and that, uh, that's how they sell the dream. And as far as I remember, Chinese consumers, top number, rank number one in terms of buying Tesla vehicles. Long story short, um, China is moving its manufacturing powerhouse to Africa, Nepal, um, Bangladesh, to Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, based on my observation, they have these ethical questions. They're trying to figure out how to apply it in the future. And third, um, if you are developing AI or data-related business, if you show the value proposition in Asia, it will be easier to get funding, specifically Sequoia Capital, Fambushi Capital, several Chinese funds um, that I know of, always looking for innovative. That's where I was telling you, if you go to Asia for funding, I think it would be easier to get the... It's, as long as I have the structure that you mentioned, I think it's the, the green light to move forward, if I answer your question. Yes, pretty much. Thank you. Sergey, uh, a philosophical question. You pretty much had a very good answer for uh, what's the future of you know, copywriters and creatives and designers in terms of you know, AI replacing them, or in fact, you know, humans and AI working you know, uh, along uh, each other and you know, producing visuals and text and books and whatever. But like, as, as a follow-on to the question I had to Amir, like, what's the future of factory workers? What's the future of truck drivers? Like, about 1% of U.S. population are drivers. Just imagine self-driving cars replacing them, right? Hard question. Yeah, you know, that because the future is not uh, very, very bright for them, I understand. But the thing is that, like, I, I would uh, love to see them getting into creative jobs, you know. Uh, but there is another issue that we didn't mention. We are, we are talking about the um, war with Russia, China, you know, uh, North Korea, and these are really big challenges for mankind generally, as we see right now. But there is a bigger issue, right, uh, that we are not talking, I mean, like we are talking in media that we are talking about, but we are not realizing. The biggest challenge is the climate change and uh, the, the life of our children will be completely changed in like 20 to 30 years. It's, it's going to be tough to live on this planet and it's going to be harder and harder all the time. So it means that uh, in terms of AI, I hope that AI will help us to survive these uh, hard times. For instance, in terms of uh, we were talking about uh, education, you know, I would love to, uh, you know, to develop um, I don't know, like a, a, a new software which based on AI, which would predict what kind of jobs we would need in 20 years and teach us those jobs, you know, because we obviously we cannot uh, collect all the knowledge of the world in our uh, brains, and uh, but AI can do that and can analyze and interpret this in the right way. So I hope that that's going to happen. As for workers, uh, there will be some new jobs. That's obvious. We we will need to fight fires in the different ways. You know, we we need to develop uh, ourselves in terms of new energies, and for that we will need new jobs, new hands. And I'm very much hoping that uh, these people will find jobs. As for China, you know, uh, I I don't know uh, why they don't have any kind of policies towards these issues, because it's, it's going to be terrible for, for China. You know, if they switch, I saw that one of the factories where the, uh, you know, the truck just entered the, the factory, the, the some elements of TV screen were uh, taken by robots. 
robots will you know build up a new tv and on the other side there was another truck that brought and they they told me that next time you come there won't be a driver so it means that uh, it it would be at least 200 jobs lost you know and for china it's going to be really tough but climate change it's a bad thing but it it will bring us new jobs like the way you are thinking uh it's not too dark it is not too gloomy um Exactly, exactly. Um, a question to all of you, but try to reiterate. Um, as angel investors, as investors, as VCs, what problems would you prioritize to be solved by startups you want to invest in? Okay. So, Sergey well, mentioned climate change. Any other priorities? Uh, honestly, when I'm investing... Uh... Uh, I just uh, try to no, don't go out of my competence. That's the most important one. And uh, I even prefer to invest in startups where uh, they tell me the problem. I didn't realize before telling me that, that there was a problem and they are solving that because that's uh, the sign for me that, okay, they have some expertise inside the field and it's not so obvious from the outside eye. So that's what I prefer in general. But uh, on the other side, yeah, I have a background in ed tech. Uh, I think that that's the most important uh, challenge in the future that uh, um, one thing like what Sergey mentioned is that, uh, uh, okay, we don't know what will be the next uh, like uh, future professions. One is which is obvious is that we should be adaptive. Like we should learn how to learn. That's already very important in nowadays. Uh, statistically, uh, there is no like most of the people already during their lifetime change their jobs dramatically, minimum twice. So they sh should learn something new, and uh, it will be the crucial thing uh, in the future as well. Um, so obviously, I I I am investing in ad tech. I understand the field, and uh, there is a uh, many many challenges in the future. So yeah, I am for sure biased, uh, subjective, but uh, I think that's a good thing for investing, honestly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sergey, just back to you. Besides climate change, and I agree that's, I think, number one uh, problem that humanity is facing. Other things that you think you know, AI and data can, can solve? In short perspective, uh, right at the moment, we are very much um, involved. Uh, you, you, you need to understand that we are not uh, investing only in IT. We are also investing in, uh, let's call it entertainment business. For instance, we recently, just like a week ago, we started uh, the first uh, uh, film that we invested uh, was filmed uh, last week. So, uh, but what we are interested, very much interested in is like a merge of blockchain and these traditional entertainment businesses, you know, where the blockchain can help, for instance, fundraise for, for films, which is a huge big issue, you know, like uh, younger um, artists, younger directors, they, they have really, especially from smaller countries, they have really, uh, it's very tough for them to find funding for, for uh, movies, for instance, for games. This is one of the directions that we are very much in, interested in. And uh, obviously, I'm mentioning uh, intellectual property all the time because this is the currency for us, you know. And uh, uh, the thing is that, like, this is going to be an, an, another new step in, the, in, uh, in a, I think, in, in the right direction in terms of developing uh, proper platforms for artists to protect their uh, currency, so to say, the, their income. And uh, the startups which are operating in these areas are very much interesting for us. And obviously, education, as I mentioned, education is the future. You know, we, we all need to develop all the time. We, we are mankind still, not half robots. That's why we need to develop ourselves to, you know, to compete uh, with each other and to compete with the nature also. And that's why education is very important. Do you see AI as being as a better educator than humans uh i you know the we we are me uh older generation i i i loved my teachers and uh, i have emotional you know connection to them uh but don't forget that the, the kids today they are different and uh, they have different issues 
they consider things that they buy in the games as the physical things you know that's why i don't know they they will have different life completely different challenges the the reasons for happiness will be different that's why nobody knows you know I, it's pretty much we, we will have obviously we will have um, an emotional connection to ai one day or another that's for sure you know do, do you wish you had a robot like ai teacher uh you know the thing is that like uh, are we sure that the pictures that we get from our youtube are real you know uh, one day or another we we won't recognize if it's a real person or not and the person will be as emotional as our teacher and uh, that's why nowadays i'm i'm old fashioned you know our old brain that's why i i cannot uh, you know for me it's very important that we sit together and we communicate but for the next generation it's going to be different and it's and we don't know if it's good or bad you know thank thank you sergey so please yeah but i think like um in terms of um you know reshaping the education it's not only like in ai is not one of the um one of the parts of the equation if you will um even like reshaping classrooms right and um I, I remember like I saw this article of Virgil Abloh, who's like a fashion designer, um, trying to identify and trying to reshape the classroom in a way that students would feel comfortable working on. Because right now, the information that we are getting doesn't come from us sitting on the desks, right? It's usually like a it's an open space, like usually like you're in front of the TV. And that is how you get the information. And you see Elon Musk, you see Kanye West, like opening up those um, schools and academies, which um, provide different vision. And hopefully, I and I do, um, I am really hopeful that it will be um, a game changer, because that is the way we should be um, treating and making sure that the digital era that we are currently living um, in is um, adapted to within the classrooms. Thank you, because I was asking about AI to Iraqli. Obviously, they will be better checking homework, especially if it's, you know, like a ABCD kind of test. You automate that, and I'm lecturing to advantage Georgian universities. Yeah, I mean, I wish there was a robot who would, you know, see if the student has answered, you know, right or wrong. And that's something can be probably some software like that already exists, right? That's simple. That's not really AI. But I'm talking about AI, like Sergey mentioned, not necessarily expressing their own emotions, but having the capacity to read the emotions of the students based on their facial expressions, based on the tone of their voice, and then changing the way, you know, they are doing as a human being would do. Because as a human being, if you see that the, you know, person you are talking to is sad, you try to cheer them up. Can AI do that? Shall we build startups? Shall we build algorithms which can do that? So that, that's an information for our audience to think. I just want to hear uh, Amir's take on that as, as an angel investor, what would you invest in, in terms of AI and data startups? Or again, like what challenges would you prioritize for AI and data to, to solve? Well, before I answer this question, thank you very much. I just want to address the audience. How many of you are students? I think you should quit now, <laughs> immediately. And there is a solution for you now. There is the foundation called Peter Thiel where you come up with a business idea, put together basic pitch deck, apply. They provide some kind of mentorship. If you win, they're going to give you capital. You get out in the market, start building something. I'm in favor of this. I started philosophy. Philosophy teaches people how to think, which is not the case in the universities or at schools. They have an old school blueprint that doesn't help you to grow up, doesn't help you to get ready. And once you finish university or school, you realize you wasted 20, 22, 25 years of 25 years of your life. When I see the PhDs, <clears throat> excuse me, when I look at PhDs, I question, what have you done, practically speaking, be it commercially or in society, to validate your PhD? Um, if you have, if there are um, PhDs in the audience, I respect you for the intelligence, but I wouldn't respect you unless you were able to validate. To answer your question. Our mission at the Sinophi at this point is to take power from centralized entities 
and decentralized give it to community, which is all about Web3. We primarily pre-seed seed investments that we make is about infrastructure projects, education, media, dealing with fake news in particular. When it comes to education, I'm a great fan of Socrates and Socrates way of teaching people was question, always ask, do not wait for the answer. Feel the power, feel the intelligence. When you get the skin in the game, you come up with the answer instead of somebody else giving you, this is A, this is B, that's the one. And number two, when it comes to media in particular, um, we are about to make uh, our investment in the first Georgian company. And these guys are dealing with the, um, on the blockchain, how to, how to counterattack or deal with the fake news powered by AI. How do you know news is fake or not? How do you validate? And they have a great solution on blockchain. And it's a shame that representatives couldn't come today. Probably in two weeks time, they're going to have a first press release in Tbilisi. I'll be happy to invite all of you to come and hear out the story. And the lastly, when it comes to NFT, you spoke about the crush. Let me talk about some positive aspects of NFT. NFT, from my personal understanding, you represent a community. It's just not, it's just not the collectible or digital collectible where you speculate. There are so many bad actors that make money. Maybe it's a good, maybe it's a bad thing. But NFTs first give power to creatives that Sergey mentioned. Two, it represents a community that you're part of. And three, it gives hope to those what we call the underdogs. And last time when Sergey and I we were on the panel in different event, I spoke about some of my employees from Afghanistan, from Palestine, from Lebanon, and we have some from Syria. They don't have a bank account in Istanbul. They don't have a bank account in their countries. And we pay them sometimes in NFT, sometimes in cryptocurrency. And that's the hope that Web3 gives to people, especially those who are underdogs in the market. Thanks, Amir. So for those of you who are students and you followed Amir's advice and quit your university, please come back because not everyone, don't listen to Amir, not everyone is born to be an entrepreneur. Remove that from your head. Don't be too tough on you. Don't be too hard on yourself because not everyone can come up with the idea, identify a problem, raise funding, build a team and manage. That's very stressful. That's very difficult. Maybe you are an amazing photographer. Maybe you are an amazing executive, but it doesn't mean you are an entrepreneur. So don't do that. Yeah, I, I agree with Peter Thiel on many things. Yeah, but also, not on this one. Yeah, yeah. There is also like one thing that I wanted to mention, like with the university, um, it brings a lot of values in you. It shows you how to be disciplined and it shows how you can get the connections that will last through the lifetime. And um, I do agree with you that like the percentage of people who dropped out of universities and made successful and are successful is really like down to like 0%. It's very rare. So, um, you know, unless you are highly motivated and know how to do things right and, um, you know, are able to test, take risks as much as you can and will be able to give up everything to pursue your, um, you know, dream, please go ahead and do it. But the chances and probability of you being, um, you know, successful if you like drop out or um, try to learn things on your own is very, very low. So, um, unless you are willing to do that, yeah, go ahead. But you know, um, in um, in Silicon Valley, there's like one one of the um, uh, one of the um, companies that I actually like looked through, which which was Theranos, and um, this girl founded a company who, with a single of a um, single drop of the blood, they would tell you like Elizabeth, Elizabeth Holmes, yes. And she was a Stanford dropout. She raised a lot of money. She was next to like, you know, um, all those, um, you know, industry um, experts. Like she was uh, um, built for a success. But now she is like, she will be in jail for like 11 years because she misled the investors. She misled the employees. And, you know, the, um, the, um, on the other side, like as as much as like she was raised and born and raised for success, like she failed because those were the risks that she took up on herself and she did not meet those goals for their uh, for her team members and the investors. So um, I want all of you to be aware how great even though like universities and colleges um, 
lack modern infrastructure, it builds discipline within you and it builds the uh, and teaches you the skill sets that you need to survive in this market. So, yeah, don't 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 do that. <laughs> I just want to ensure that you guys don't do it because, yeah. you know, the risks is like really, really high. Right. And the probability of success is really low. Yeah. Thank you. So far. and again, like we are a data fest, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, we are we, we are we are a data fest, right? I mean, we should be, you know, ma making more or less data driven decisions. And of course, you know, Silicon Valley has been, you know, glorified, and it's very pink. And Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And by the way, those guys are the exceptions. Those guys are the uh, dropouts who build successful companies. So Zuckerberg, Gates, Jobs, maybe a couple of others. But statistically speaking, as Sopo mentioned most of the successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley and elsewhere have proper high higher education, right? And the second thing is, as I said, I've been running startup support programs for 11, 12 years. I've seen thousands, maybe, I, I stopped counting, you know, entrepreneurs I've worked with. There are people who are amazing and bright and smart. They can do incredible things in this life, but they cannot start a business. And by the way, there's also very uh, interesting caveat here. I, I love discussing this recently. A person who can build a successful startup and a person who can run a successful startup, it's not necessarily the same person. So you might be bright and talented enough to start the startup, but then you should also be vulnerable enough to realize that this is a point that you no longer enjoy or you are no longer capable of doing that. You just don't catch up with growing. So maybe it's time you know, to become a serial entrepreneur and leave this thing and, and go and build uh, the next thing. All right, Irakli, maybe you have a take on this as, as a serial entrepreneur who's done this many, many times. I fully agree on uh, with you. Like, uh, yeah, there is time to uh, pass to others to run the companies. Uh, I don't know, maybe Tim Cook is not an entrepreneur style, style of person, right? It's yeah, for sure. And maybe Steve Jobs wouldn't be the Steve Jobs without him. So that's uh, well, that's true. Statistically speaking, I agree with you that uh, yeah, uh, dropping out from the universities isn't the best idea, statistically, statistically speaking. But uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, are you getting enough value from the universities in the four year you're spending there? So maybe we should fix it. Um, it's not the good thing currently. Like best colleges in, in the world uh, doesn't give you the like materials because it's available now online for free. But the connections. That's why like um, Harvard is a four-year interview, not like uh, I, I will be teach something uh, success formula which will which I will use in the in the future in my life, right? But yeah. Um, Still, if you can be accepted by Howard, do it. <laughs> a good point, because in our part of the world, I believe many Georgians and also you know, people from the neighboring countries will agree with me. During the Soviet era and back in the 90s and even today, the value of higher education, I would say by the vast majority of people, is the diploma itself, is the degree something to write on your CV. But I think we should change that, not just, oh no, forget university and go start a business, but versus use that time as much as possible, try to get as much value as possible from the time, like you're building network with your, you know, uh, classmates, with your uh, mentors and lecturers and, and other uh, stuff. Yeah, just to add to Amir's point and agree with, literally two days ago, I spoke with my mother. Uh, she was asking me regarding my brother who is doing his master's in law. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and he's already building things. He He's really creating the value, but uh, he's probably not get his master diploma. And when she asked me if uh, it's good, maybe you, you, I will speak with him to motivate him to like get his diploma. And I, I said that I won't because I don't think that it's a good idea. She asked me at the end, please don't tell it to him, right? So for all the generations, diploma still is a thing, still has a value. And it doesn't. So if you are studying somewhere to get a diploma, it's worthless. Uh, what I told to my mother, and I will repeat to students or fellows here, is that if you somewhere will need your diploma, you are in a bad, bad situation. It's a worst case uh, currently to 
get accepted somewhere because of your diploma. Because, yeah, at the end of the day, we are already living in a world where knowledge is important. I never ask for diploma for from every any of my employees, right? Me too. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I think we can open the floor uh, through questions. If, if there are any, just raise your hand. I will just ask someone to take uh, one of these microphones. Uh, maybe we can take Iraqi's microphone, yeah? And... Uh, You, you need to turn it on, yeah. Can you hear me now? So to the guys, with, so Amir just said, like, we should quit university and go, and then there was a massive backlash from you guys. And I've been writing this question because I really want to get a concise answer. So you're saying that people should work in careers that they dislike for 40 years, building someone else's dream because you're saying that they are not skilled, they don't have the drive, they don't have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. This is what you are saying, right? But would you not agree that people who actually drop out, who go for it, they learn from their failures? We've all, I mean, all of you sitting there probably failed before in something, and you learn from those failures. This is what teaches people to be better, right? Because going to university, and also to caveat what I think you were just saying, you were saying that university, oh no, you, you were saying that university is where you build connections, where you build discipline, right? So in a way, it's a descent, like it's like an NFT organization where you get into a group and you start meeting with people. But that means you need to pay more money to get better connections. And not everyone can afford to go to Harvard. So my question is, to get to the meat and potatoes of this, is it not better to go for your dreams, put everything you have working up, let's say you get a job, you leave university, and you show through your work ethic, you show to people who already have these connections, which we could probably never afford, that you are a hard worker, that you're creative, and you build yourself up through that versus going to a university, getting a degree, and then doing a job which ultimately, as we are discussing now, will be replaced by AI, by AI in about five or 10 years. Is the question addressed to one all of, of us? Or all of you Except Amir, obviously. You're with me on this. I, I'm, I'm very far from, you know, advising somebody on education. Uh, you know, the, the thing is that, like, what uh, ideal for me, if I would be, 18 years old, and uh, at my age, at my 18, I was in the army, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, coming back to the university, so the, the standard was that you finish the school, you go to the university, which is absolutely crazy, you know, because you are young, you want to party, you want to meet people. So the, I, I would suggest, according to, to my wishes and my dreams, just to go and see the world, because you, you will identify problems you will see people you will get connections you know you you meet some crazy people some nice people well, some nasty people and you will understand what is your what you're capable of this this time is very important this is what we there was a lack of it in uh, soviet union because we were like in the fast track it was we were numbers you know so and so many you know, like um, whatever doctors released from medical university of Georgia, etc. But in reality, people were, were just buying diplo diplomas there. So I would go and uh, travel a lot, get the connections there. This is another chance to find nice people, work there, you know, because you can do jobs, you know. Yeah, you can apply to, to jobs and uh, try some different areas, uh, you know, and uh, this will help you. The orientation is very important. What you are capable of, what is your interest, what powers you, are you, are you a lazy guy who's like into working, writing poems at night? Okay, do it, try it. If it works, yeah, go, go, go on with it. But on any level, wherever you are, try to read. This is the most important thing, I think, because we switch to visual things. You know, we are watching videos all the time, but reading is very important. Read old books, important books, you know, like the, there are thousands of lists that you need to read books. This will develop you in a different way. This will, you know, challenge your brain and it will help. As for education, you know, the thing is that like AI, a teacher, whatever, what if you are not ready for education? I'm ready to educate myself right now. I would be happy to go to university to listen and meet some bright minds. You know, that that's how I'm, uh, you know, 
ready for that. At that time, I was not ready. 18 years, 19 years, 20 years old, I was like thinking about girls and partying, you know, that was the only object that I had at that time. So I think it, it needs time. It's very individual, you know, every person is different. So that's why there are no ready recipes for that, I think. And I think the education is the best investment you can do for yourself. And, you know, growing up, I always felt that responsibility to be involved in um, growing myself. And that is why I truly believe that, as I said before, um, investing in your, in your education is the most important thing. The how factor is on an, on another side um, is another thing, right? You can just you know go to Coursera, like pick up the courses that you like, and um, try to get a certificate or whatnot. But for me, university worked. Uh, it showed me that I am capable of um, understanding um, the subjects that I wasn't aware of. I got, um, I had a connection with our um, lectures lecturers, uh, our teachers who provided a lot of guidance in terms of like, you know, you know with the books uh, in um, to say the least, right? So they shared the experience that was truly very valuable to me. And the third part was the connections. Like I, I see my um, alumni, my, um, my classmates like across different industry and I can always just pick up the phone and call them in case I need something and we've helped each other out and we've advised each other with a lot of things like including finance marketing or whatnot so I think those I mean whatever works for you you should definitely do it but for the most of us I'm I'm, I'm thinking that education was the most like crucial part that we got through um through college or university or high school or um whatever Sure, and, and I think data backs what I said and what Sergey and, and Sopo said, statistically speaking, and again, there's a huge body of research done in the US, in the Silicon Valley, in other countries, most of the successful startups, most of the successful companies are founded not by 20 something year old university dropouts, but they're founded by people in their mid thirties. This is normally not their first startup. They probably had you know a failure or two before that. They have education, they have master's degree, bachelor's degree um, and yeah they also have because they are in their mid-30s they probably have some real life experience and I think that's what Sergey said like when you from the high school you immediately enter the university and then you drop out and start a startup startup to fix what have you identified any problems do you know how to solve that problem you need the university and you need the real life experience so th this might sound again a bit counterintuitive I'm an angel investor I run hackathons I, I run startup support programs and when i meet a young person i'm not telling them oh start a startup or get a job at a startup you know what i'm telling them go work for a large company go over go study abroad and then come back and then you will start your startup because because i think they need that experience while to, to if they are entrepreneurial they will identify problems if they're entrepreneurial they will come up with solutions to those problems if not let them just i don't know, become accountants or like i said singers whatever there's nothing wrong with uh, composing music. <laughs> sure, sure, thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, please. Hey, everyone. It's Alexei from Social Lab. I'm a data scientist and AI researcher. So I have two comments, two questions very fast. So the first comment also for dropping off from universities, I think it rather invest in um, accelerating uh, education experiences and learning, I would say, habits, because the more people are now connected, to uh, the internet and social networking, uh, learning habits are a little bit different. And uh, the second comment also for you, Haik, uh, you, uh, you asked a question whether uh, there are any existing solutions that might uh, like bring like facial, for instance, an analysis or facial analyzers in school rooms and so on. Um, to my knowledge, I know that there are somehow existing solutions, but in the in clinical from a clinical per perspectives, but they might be uh, ready to be integrated in schools. I think so. The first question for you, Sergi, uh, you mentioned that if we could have an AI um, solution or something that can be predicted by AI that we can uh, know uh, in in advance in twenty twenty years, what would be actually needed in the market that can uh, pretty much help and actually. Uh, the existing uh, educational landscape, for instance. Do you think, the question is, do you think that 
with the existing knowledge and experiences in the market, we have mature, I mean, they are mature enough to be fed into a machine learning model to predict some kind of 20 years uh, uh, thing in advance, knowing that it's it's actually being accelerated exponentially and with uncertainty. And the second question for everyone in the, in the panel, uh, that if you decide to invest in a specific industry like education, uh, healthcare, or automotive, for instance, what drives you to take this decision? Is it uh, about the growth rate and the market value of this industry, or there are other drivers? Thank you so much. Okay, the, this this was uh, my wishful thinking. You know, like I I hope that uh, we have. I I don't think that we have enough knowledge to do that right now, and we we can we cannot even feed. Uh, you know, um, uh, AI with uh, the knowledge that we will we would need in the future. But um, uh, interpretation is a very important part of, of AI. This is what we are hoping that AI would do for us. Uh, at least uh, variations of future jobs would be, it, it would be a breakthrough, you know, like even to have like many different solutions, not solutions, but ways that we could go. It, that would be already in a way, it would orientate uh, the next generation. But I'm very much hoping that, you know, while we having the, you know, the knowledge of how many centuries, like thousands of centuries at least preserved in some different ways, this already gives a, an opportunity to variate, interpret uh, the future. And while we also understand the development in the, uh, in the, in the climate, in the nature, the, this is also a very big, a good beginning. I, I very much hope that that's gonna happen. That's not gonna happen, I think next uh, like 20, 50 years, but uh, definitely this, this would go in this direction and uh, uh, people are thinking about that. And as you probably know, I'm not saying anything new, Whatever we are thinking of, uh, it's gonna materialize one day or another. So I, I'm very much hoping about. It. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And second question: Who wants to take it? Yep. Okay. So question was: uh, What uh, motivates me to invest uh, if uh, it's a domain I'm expertise in? Right. Uh, first of all, in Georgia, for me, like uh, because there are many entrepreneurs who are not experienced; they're very young. Uh, for them, many of them are asking money when the, it is too early. They have not done anything. They just an, have an idea and want to fundraise. I think that's a red flag or they are not ready yet. My advice to them is that, okay, first of all, there are many things you can do before raising money. There is many things you can do without a money just to validate some things or, or stuff like that. So if that's the case, you should first of all do this and then come to, to investors or angels or etc. right? And uh, uh, if that's not the case, then if what, what traction there is, and under traction, I don't mean that there's a revenue or some, I don't know, signups or something like that, but you already have to interview some potential 100 customers or something like that. You should really understand the problem. That's the most important basic things. There are much more for sure. Uh, for the later, you know, like stages, obviously, but yeah, that's a uh, like clear starting point. Sure, sure. Uh, sorry, not to answer the second part. So, I, uh, obviously, there are um, many startups coming. Like we, um, it's our experience of two months. I would say we met Sura. I think at least sixty different startups. We we would communicate in, in this uh, time. Um, Unfortunately, there were maybe three or five uh, of startups asking for consultation, you know, for advice or knowledge or networking. Most of them were asking for money. And uh, I, I think that it's a, it's a very, a really very big sign uh, because uh, obvious, like typical, uh, you know, problems that the startups have from our perspective. IP as usual, nobody cares about that. Uh, security, you know, there are like we met like when was it two three weeks ago? Uh, a startup, they had such a big holes in their you know uh, whatever uh, IT product. You know, uh, I I would suggest that like 
first of all, you need to understand that, like, especially like big investors, they have a team of people analyzing whatever you are bringing to them. And uh, you need to uh, sound credible. You need to be like, it, it should be like a proper, not a product maybe, but you need to identify what problems you have and maybe talk about these problems to, to the investor. Because in, in our case, we, we are happy to help you spend our time. Uh, we call it um, uh, like babysitting, you know, like uh, grow, uh, grow the startup. We want to identify their problems. And if the idea is great, we would join the, their, their way to, to success, you know. And this is very important. They, you, you need to understand that this is like, especially right now, it's uh, for investors, it's, uh, th these people are already, even in Georgia, they know exactly uh, where to invest. You know, and uh, money, it's not an easy money for um, many of them. And it's not e easy to give the money to somebody who is not sure and not credible. That's why please think about things that you need, first of all, and go with uh, with this, uh, you know, needies to, to, to the investor, talk about this. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you will get through, you know, it, it, it's, it's not only honesty, it's just being clever enough for them. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Ali wants to clarify the uh, question. Yes. I just need to. Um, uh, thank you for the answer. I just need to uh, uh, make make it a little bit tailored to the to the to my question. So, what I mean is that if, for instance, we you have, for instance, two applications uh, from two startups, they're both meeting the requirements. One in the education and one in the automotive. What do you where actually? And you you need to have or you or you, or you can take only one uh, uh, project. Where do you go, and why do you decide in education, or why you decide you decided on, for instance, automotive? What drives you to to decide on the industry itself, not from a business perspective? Thank you. Okay, you need to understand what's happening in the background. For instance, in in our company, so this uh, um, your pitch would go through at least three different groups. So uh, the, these groups will identify the, the first of all learn the industry you you are coming from uh, uh, we'll learn what is happening in the industry right now we'll we'll research on what type of startups are on the market right now here but also globally because we we work with many different uh, uh, smaller companies who are helping us to identify startups and uh, you know whatever you are bringing to us and uh, only after that, and I'm not the person who will say yes or no. You know, it is going to be a team of eleven, if I'm not mistaken, right now, Zura. And uh, they will, uh, they will. Uh, it, it will be, you know, inside the discussion there. And at the end, you will get the email from, basically, from the. It's going to be a decision of analytics, and then eleven people who may have an emotional kind of connection to you while watching you on the screen or while meeting you there. Uh, so. I, I, have an, I have an idea how to paraphrase Ali's question, of course, with your permission, but we're gonna give you literally one second to each of you to answer. Um, high impact, low return, or low return by high impact? Which one would you choose to invest in? And you are the decision maker, high not, not impact, your high return. No, you don't have that option. Unfortunately, you don't have that option. Well, that's all what we aim for here. So yeah, I mean, on our end, we look for high impact, high return type of um, startups. Um, and um, yeah, but but let's really imagine a situation that there is a startup, you know, which is, uh, you know, the addressable market is relatively small. They will never be a unicorn. I don't know, the exit is, I don't know, $15 million, but, but they will change the world. And then there is a unicorn, right? What I'm saying is like, if there's an opportunity to change the world or opportunity to make a, you know, 100X on your investment, would you change the world or would you, you know, bet on the money? Obviously, I mean, uh, you know, high return is a very nice kind of thing, not being very greedy uh, in person, but you, you need to understand that it's not, uh, it, it, this money comes from several different people, and you, you, they want fast return, not only uh, return. Uh, they want uh, fast return. Guys, you have one second, and you have to choose one. Yeah, I, I would say like, uh, if I have to choose, it's it's uh, obviously the return for high return. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, 
High return. High return. Sure. Iraqli. Hipsters love, you know, making money. Of okay. course. I mean, it's their main goal. <laughs> but, you know, with, um, that was like um, Rico 2022 and Mark Cuban was one of um, one of the uh, participants in the panel. And he just started this high impact business, which is cost plus drugs. And before that, he was looking at all of his um, investments as a business and a way to make money. And it depends on at which stage you are. For Mark Cuban, you know, coming from his experience, now it was it was the right time. Money is no longer a motivator, yeah, right? Not money was no longer a motivator, and that is why he just started uh, going in the um, pharmacy pharmaceutical business. So for for me personally, like I'm looking into um, high return, but you know you will never know what will change, right? And what what will spark your joy? Sure. Exactly. Okay. Um, my answer as an investor, yeah, I try not to be emotional, so high return for sure. But good thing is that uh, in reality, high return, high impact is very correlated because if there's no high, like uh, important things to change, then there's no high return as well. Yeah. Right. Amir, good thing. I'm happy to be Black Swan. If, if we made 10 investments, eight of them were impact-based, even though we lost capital, but we, we got fantastic team. And two, to answer your question, um, if you cannot articulate your idea in less than 10 seconds, it's the red flag for me. And if you don't make storytelling a core of whatever you do, it's another red flag for me. So that's why we pay a lot of attention to storytelling abilities, articulation abilities, and specifically telling, Not I wouldn't use the word change the world, but what sort of impact are we talking about and how it's going to be achieved. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, this has been quite a, uh, you're quite a panel, thank you.